We are from Comcast. It's a big tech company from out uh, in the, on the East Coast. We're all based out of Philadelphia. We do a lot of really nice things with uh, Spark and uh, with machine learning and everything, and uh, hopefully this should give you a good introduction into what we've been doing. So um, uh, just a little bit of a background. Uh, both Sridhar and I are in the big data analytics team at Comcast, and we do all of the analytics for, um, like, you know, for Comcast across all of the divisions, all the operational areas, uh, and I'll go into that in, uh, in a little while. So we have data coming in from everywhere, and we do all of that analysis. And um, Sridhar and I, we uh, take the lead on this thing. We have a whole team of engineers, and uh, we do a lot of really fun things with it. So why actually even do this, right? And so like, you know, this is the agenda over here. Uh, we, like, you know, we, um, we, I'll talk about like, you know, how we got here, where we, and where we started from, how we got here. Uh, what are the challenges that we faced, how we solved them, and uh, like, you know, going forward, what are the challenges that we are, like, you know, that we are seeing. Some of the really nice tools that we've built to overcome some of these challenges, including a tool uh, that we call internally as Roadrunner, and then leave some room for Q&A. Um, just to get a little bit of the background, um, at Comcast, like, you know, we have, um, if somebody's not familiar with it, we have four distinct, distinct lines of business. The video where, like you know, we um, like, uh, stream all of the cable TV uh, channels to our customers' homes and uh, offices. We have the internet where we provide, like you know, we are the ISP, one of the biggest on the planet. And then we have uh, the uh, the digital voice, the telephone service. Um, and then we have the Xfinity Home, which is the home security system. We've also announced now that we are going to go into mobile, but uh, right now, like you know, all, all of our focus is on the four big areas. Mobile is going to be a big one going forward, and we are going to tackle that. But we don't have, we don't talk about any of that in this particular presentation. Um, and then, oh, before I go in there, so uh, from each of those areas, right? So we have uh, all these customers across the Comcast footprint, and then we bring in data from a variety of different systems, right? Like we we uh, try to understand how customers are using our products, all the challenges that they face in like doing business with us. We get over 300 million calls into our call centers every year. We have 20 million truck rolls every year. All this data, like you know, if you imagine transcribing all of those calls and trying to do text mining on all, on all of those transcribed, uh, uh, like you know, the calls, but, like we do uh, uh, a lot of that already. Uh, we need to analyze a lot of the financial performance. We need to do a lot of prescript prescriptive, descriptive, and predictive analytics using all of this data. We have uh, in excess of 50 Hadoop clusters at Comcast, but the two main ones, the biggest ones that we use, one is a data lake where all of the data lands from all of the operational systems, and then we have one, um, the, the huge cluster just for my team. It is uh, it's about 500 plus nodes. Um, uh, we have uh, all of the data coming in. We have several really tall data sets, uh, each like you know trillion plus rows. Rows. We have data sets in excess of. 12,000 columns. Uh, we have tons of models. Like you know, we have like you know over 500 models doing a lot of the like you know the traditional the data science activities. Like you know, doing regressions, LDA, all the the vanilla ones, plus some really sophisticated ones that we built. And I'll talk about a little bit about that um, in a in a couple more slides from now. And then like you know, we do uh, not just the pre the predictive and the prescriptive stuff. We also do a lot of optimizations, like the geospatial optimizations. And then going forward, all of the challenges that I face, uh, and then how we are trying to solve all of those things. I'll just talk about that. So uh, some of the use cases, of course, like you know, you must be familiar with all of these things. Like you know, we have to do churn models, how to predict how, uh, like you know, every customer's like you know propensity to churn, the pricing elasticity. Now this is a big one that impacts a lot of different operational areas, right? So we want to go and understand um, uh, every customer's willingness to pay, how that changes over time. We need to understand, like, you know, let's say we raise a price by X number of dollars, what happens in each particular neighborhood, not just in a division, a division or region, but if, what can we expect for customers reacting to that price increase? How our promotions roll off and what is the impact of promotions rolling off? How can we do get, get to, like, you know, like the everyday best pricing kind of a model if, like, you know, if we chose to? 
So we do a lot of analysis around pricing. And then, of course, like you know, I mentioned the geospatial stuff to optimize all of the truck routes. We want to like, optimize. Truck routing is like, you know, the immediate, uh, the kind of the low-hanging fruit. But if you think about it, we have millions of miles of cables, the fiber cables, the, uh, the, like, you know, the actual coax cables, all of that going like, you know, routed all over the place. We need to uh, lay out and do the optimization around the cable routing. Um, like, you know, for example, it cannot cross a highway, like, you know, if there's a river in between and a stream in between, how do we get the cable across? How can we minimize the cost of the cabling? You know, all of that stuff. We need to do a lot of the optimizations around that. Uh, we have to do, like, you know, marketing, like, you know, a lot of analytics around marketing, like, you know, the, the direct mail is one of them. And then, as I mentioned, the customer call analytics, like, you know, how can we help improve the customer service experience? Um, we know we get a lot of bad press with, like, you know, with our customer service. Internally, our goal is to get to zero. Like, you know, get, like, you know, we have a very low tolerance for bad customer service, and we want to do everything that we can to help improve it and make every customer delighted with what we offer. So we do a lot of analytics that drive that as well. Here's an example of the direct mail, captain, like, you know, the optimization where, uh, like, you know, every month when we send out, like, you know, the mailers into every customer's homes, we do, uh, like, you know, we segment the customers. We try to understand, like, you know, what are the kind of customer, kinds of customers that we target and the expected return on that kind of a mailing and what is our budget for every mailing. So, we, so this is a tool that's already in production. It's one of the biggest impact tools from, like, you know, from marketing and sales perspective that we've already deployed that, drive, that is driven off our, like, you know, the, the data science as a service, the platform that we have built. And Sridhar is going to talk a lot about that. And then this is another one, like, you know, this is a customer journey. So again, like, you know, everything that we do, like, you know, the, I know machine learning is a, is a very cool uh, thing, like, you know, like nice to talk about, but there's very little of, like, you know, machine learning that we do in this thing. Like, you know, this is a very descriptive kind of a process, trying to understand every customer's flow, like, you know, through all of the touch points and interactions that they have with Comcast. What are like you know how is how are they flowing between like you know one process to another like you know from the customer's perspective and from the internal perspective as well, so this is one of the tools that we've used, and then again like you know coming back to the challenges right like you know there's only the way I see it there's only one kind of data and that's imperfect data, no matter how much like you know we do how much cleansing we do, there's still a lot of data quality like you know that we have to solve especially when we are dealing with the kind of data sets and the volumes that we are faced with, right? So, like, you know, the feature engineer, engineering now, this is one big thing that we did, that, that we built, it's actually now um, going into production. So what this does is, you, like, you know, let's say you've never seen a data set before. You, know, you don't know what a SQL table looks like, what a CSV file looks like, doesn't matter what it is. We just go, like, you know, go, we go profile the data. All of the things that a data scientist would do in the beginning, even before thinking of deploying a model, this one, like, you know, this tool actually goes out and like, it does all of those things like, from a statistical perspective. Profile the data, understand every single column, like, you know, like, understand the data skew with every column. Uh, figure out which of them like, you know, are the categorical variables, which are the factor variables. And then more critically, like, uh, isolate all of the numerical columns and then see if we can, like, you know, if they're correlated to begin with. So the highly correlated columns, like you know, the, the, model, the modeler does not really use, need to use all of those columns. They can use just one of them as input variables and we, he's done, right? So like, you know, the, he, we done correlations and we provide a really nice way of visualizing those correlations. And I don't have that to show it to you here, but like, you know, that's what we do. Plus, we, we go a, a, little, a, little, bit more, a little bit more deeper. Uh, we run a PCA on it. We, do, like, we look to see if there, we can reduce the dimensionality. And then, or if we can derive new metrics from this data, even without seeing it, well, like, you know, even without visualizing the data or even eyeballing the data, like, you know, run the PCA and understand all of the different variances. Then if there are, like, let us say, in a, in a data set with 1,000 columns, if just 100 of them are, um, are describing the data, like, you know, with, uh, with about, let's say, like, you know, 90% variance or a 95% variance, then why even bother, like, you know, go doing all of the other columns, like, you know, right as an as initial step? Of course, as data scientists, we want to go look at every single column and every single column's impact on a model. But this is a starting point, and it covers a vast majority of our use cases. So we do that, that kind of work with the feature engineering. Then we have like, the, the model scoring algorithms that actually, like, you know, that once the data scientists and the modelers go build these models, 
we have to go and automate it, like you know, in a heavy manner, so that on a, almost on a daily basis we have to go rerun these models on all of the input data. So we go do all of that. And then this platform that we have built, the operational consumption, like you know, this is what we have. We have downstream consumers, that, which are typically other operational systems, like you know, in a company the size of Comcast, we have hundreds and hundreds of other systems that are in use. All of them need to consume our data to uh, help make it their own processes better. So uh, Sridhar is going to talk about that service. So like, you know, the, that's what we have. Like, you know, the, so these are all the challenges that we faced, like, you know, and, then, and then we solved it. Literally in the past one year, we've solved, like, we've come a long way. We took a, uh, our own time to actually like, you know, build the platform and getting the data, like, you know, got all of the data in, in and then like, you know, now we are in the business of actually like, you know, implementing things going forward. So we are no, lo no longer at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. So we actually now are in, are in full production mode now where the work that we are doing is actually now making a big impact everywhere. So as I mentioned, like, you know, the data quality is always a huge challenge, right? So uh, for, the, like, you know, for the data sizes that we, are like, you know, that we have to um, like, you know, manage and handle and everything, uh, like, you know, we, have to, like, you know, we have to make sure that the data is pristine, as pristine as it can be. And Roadrunner is a tool that actually does it. We, um, uh, I brought in a lot of the, you know, these statistical pro process control methods, like you know, from manufacturing, to help solve data quality issues. We understand and we are very transparent about our data, like you know, to other teams as well, so that nobody is actually like you know, questioning the the validity of our data. So, like you know, the the tool that we used actually goes out and does all of this work, and then we have multiple teams consuming this, uh, like uh, all of these data. And then they also work on the same data set to actually build these data sets. So in order to do this, like, you know, what we needed was one central processing system. Like, you know, despite uh, having a nice big cluster and uh, Cloudera, uh, who is our, like, you know, the main, uh, the, the, who is our vendor for my cluster, they keep telling me that we are running the biggest Impala cluster on the planet. It's the biggest Kudu cluster on the planet. So like, you know, all of the challenges that they see in the data volumes, like, you know, we get to see first. So that like, you know, uh, other customers are like, you know, they're, they're, they don't get to uh, like, you know, deal with these kind of problems. So fine tuning Impala for all of these queries. Now Impala is just one, one way, right? Like, you know, it's just a SQL engine. We have hundreds of thousands, thousands of lines of Spark code in production. Everything that we do nowadays is pretty much in Spark. Impala is just a nice way of like, you know, for other data scientists and everything just to go eyeball the data. So they do, they, they, they do it if they don't know how to write Spark code. But internally for in my team, everything is done in Spark. So like, you know, so we needed to build a platform that can provide this kind of scalability. And despite having thousands of cores in it, I still am not happy with the latencies that we are getting, although things are very fast. Like, you know, the, before just last year, like, like, you know, just like, you know, same time last year, some queries that used to take several days to run, now, like, you know, they take, like, you know, in the order of minutes. So we've done, a, we've come a long way in optimizing the work that we do, but I still am not, I'm not happy with it. Now we are going big time into, like, GPUs and, like, you know, and, and like, you know, and all the other, like, you know, kind of the non-big data like you know the, the the tools and technologies to help me get there in millisecond response times. Now the data, like you know, one thing I did not mention, the, all of the data in Comcast, like you know, and much as much as in uh, like in much like as in other companies, they come at different velocities. We have like you know applications that we have built on real time data, where we have millisecond or like you know or just like you know a few second uh, latencies. On like you know, on, on by the time it arrives in our like you know in the backend platforms to the time it actually makes it into our our visualization tools to data like you know that actually like comes once a month for example like you know a lot of the data sets that we acquire from other vendors comes in once a month so like you know we're dealing with data that arrives at different like you know like you know uh, frequencies and at different uh, stages in time so we need to be able to manage all of that. So we have the SQL capabilities, we have the API, now the API is now this is what our talk is about. So the API is a nice way for so downstream uh, applications to consume what we do. So like, you know, it does all of that. And then, like, you know, and then we have the, like, you know, it's a multi-tenancy model because we have a lot of other uh, departments also using this data. So now, like, you know, Sridhar is going to talk a, uh, more about this. We have a RESTful API, we have, like, you know, it's a, it's a Spark engine that's always running. We, we just get all of that data, we process it. 
we have a lot of connectors to other databases. Um, we, of course, like you know, Kafka is, is actually core and central to our platform. We push data out there, um, and then we also have like you know a Storm-based application that also consumes all of this data, and we have data files like you know in many different formats: ORC, Parquet, all of that stuff. Um, and then, of course, like you know, like you know, a company the size of Comcast, given its visibility, we have to make sure that only the right people with access to sensitive data get to it. So we have role-based access con control in there. Uh, Kerberos is actually, if we are going into it big time this year, but uh, but we already implemented role-based access control already. So Kerberos is just another nice thing that we do. And of course, like you know, we have uh, tools like you know, we have data scientists who use like Python, they use R, they use SAS. They write their own Java code, whatever. Like you know, and then uh, they can, we need to be able to make our data and the and the API available to all of those different tools and technologies, and that's what we built. And then the main thing is right. You know, the workflow management. A lot of companies, like you know, are not in that stage yet. But for us, we need to to automate everything. We need to like you know make sure that we get to the state where we manage by exception. I am not in the luxury of always being able to add headcount to manage of our, our processes, so I need to be able to scale up using technology itself as much as possible. So the automated workflow management is a bit, big part of my strategy, and we have gotten that done very nicely already the, this year. And uh, with Cloudera's the, the, the data science workbench that they've released, we, uh, we got it installed into a production mode literally on the same week that they released it. So it's actually a big, like, you know, very nice looking tool that will help us manage these uh, thousands and thousands of models and like workflows that we have, including the data quality checks, all of that, like, you know, automate all of that. So that's what we do. So with that, I'll pass it over to Sridhar, and he's going to talk more in depth about all of the other tools and the APIs. Is it on, right? Yes. All right, now let's get into more exciting parts, like how you can do it yourself too, or uh, we are trying to open source it, so hopefully this year we'll get the approval. Uh, needless to say, uh, to Karen's point, the biggest problem is not like you do not know an algorithm or anything, but yeah, logistic regression wise, you can follow YouTube videos or something from Coursera and do it in a day, but you do need to give it the right X and Y, otherwise Y equal to MX plus C makes no sense if the X and Y are random. Like you can give continuous variables, for example, for age and sex of a person. So what does it mean? Nothing really. 21, 22, 23, 24, male, 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 male. It doesn't mean anything. What you really need to do in such cases, just a hypothetical case, is probably get some segmentation, some age segment. Maybe it's 20 to 30 year old working professionals, maybe it's 20 to 30 year old uh, high school dropouts. So you need all those information. That's actually a real need for the business, right? So what we tried to do was try to solve some of these things for all the data scientists and the other engineers together so they don't need to go and learn Spark, Apache Spark, come here, listen to all the sessions, and start writing code, rather than that we, like, we just leave them in their caves. we are like, okay, stay there, it's fine. You don't need to come out. We'll give you all the data that you need. And if they, they do something wrong, they need to be able to just quickly do something else. That's another big motto, uh, the motive for why we did this. So the first screen shows you what Roadrunner is. Roadrunner has a lot of modules inbuilt. Uh, it's pretty much 100% Scala as far as the engine goes. And I know the obvious question someone will ask is, why didn't you use Livy or some other REST API server? It's actually way beyond that. Uh, what we do in Roadrunner is we actually implement and then we allow you to implement new things. So it's not like we are trying to run a perpetual job server. We are actually implementing functionality for you. And you can plug and play little things. So after nice research, if you think that there is a specific transformation that you would like to happen, you just plug it in. And then after that, you interact using REST API. So that's why it shows you quite a bit of uh, the processor, how the Roadrunner query language. It has its little DSL, domain-specific language. Nowadays, it's very easy to write it. So we don't use Antler. That's another simple answer to a question. Antler doesn't work for this, so we just wrote a very basic scripting parser, not much. So what, what does it really do, right? How does the Roadrunner work? Roadrunner works by exposing everything to a RESTful API so that internally all the logic is built, all the workflows are built, so you don't really need to understand every little thing, but you can always contribute, of course. So that's why we are trying to make it open source. So here, uh, you're saying user one, two, three, and four. 
They're all going into the Roadrunner. They're all trying to do different things. So one person is trying to do just the processing. He just wants to see what's happening. The other guy, he's trying to invoke a feature engineering uh, massive process. I'll just give you an example. The most recent feature engineering uh, process that we kicked off, it took a whole 24 hours using 10,000 cores, because that's the kind of data that Comcast has. So it took like overnight, and it was doing looking at 12,000 columns. It was grouping all the columns together, trying different types of PCAs and SVD because we need to do comparative analysis. We need to give both. And then in the end, of course, uh, another person came in. He tried to run some random forests on 500 columns in one shot because the, uh, they were trying to kind of, you know how it is now in data science, right? Everything is about money. And if you can get a little more nickels and dimes, that's the business. So how do you get something more? Like, because the market is so saturated already, like, what do you really get to? If you ask uh, anyone from any wireless provider, why are you leaving? There are a number of reasons, and everyone has the same reason. So that's why we keep doing that. So to provide them with an API layer so that they can quickly invoke some REST APIs is our goal. So this is our REST API. This is what it looks like. It's just JSON. There's nothing there that you really need to understand, you, except that you need to understand a little more about what does the JSON look like, what should you specify in some cases. So other than that, you don't really need to worry too much about it. This is another example. Someone wanted to just take everything uh, with the return on marketing investment, Romy, and then the connects, connects is the probability. We use Basia Lab for this. But the Basia Lab shouldn't be looked at by everyone else. So what we said was, hey, why don't you uh, just use our API? The secret sauce to this and the end result is so exciting that the first screen that you saw with direct mail campaign optimization, that is, was built by four people who were doing D3JS. And they did not know any Spark or Scala or Java or C, C++, Python, nothing. But they could do the entire product on their own because all we gave them is a contract and the REST API and the documentation. We helped them. So that's all uh, our involvement was. So these are more in-depth uh, examples. These are the examples of transformations. Few of the transformations we, we provide through the REST API. So you can just say, I want to convert everything to lowercase. I want to convert everything to uppercase. Those are little things. Anyone can do that. But the more exciting things come, the last but one is the latest edition we have is a decile. Now, to do decile, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are completely familiar with it. It's kind of dividing it into 10 segments so that everything should be proportional and uh, you can say fair. It should be fair. So how do you do that? It's a fair balance partitions when you only have like about, what, like two or three billion rows, but make it one trillion now. You can't do that. Like, you can. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you will also have to sit with me, have coffee, and we will both try to figure out the same thing, right? But why are you wasting your time? Because that is not your job, really. All you needed was you needed the decile segments so you can go ahead and do build your model. Could be Basia Lab. It could be maybe you're using it in some neural network, logistic regression. I don't even need to know where you want to use it. Or maybe you just want to report on it. Nice little pretty pie chart. So that's why the decile, I'll show you the example, the code itself. So that's what we're getting into now. So this is the examples of some joins. We have a lot more joins, of course, uh, because these are the basic ones. Then we have anti-joins or semi-joins. But remember that we are pretty much giving everything that Spark can give uh, in an API layer, plus we added more. So the decides we use Spark, but again, that's our own functionality that we added. Uh, similarly, similar to that, we also have something called Z-score, if you see that there. Uh, let's see if this works. I don't know how to point it, but there's a z-score there. So z-score is simple, right? You just need to take the average, the mean, then you compute the standard deviation, you get the z-score. But how do you simply say, hey, uh, take your massive table of 12,000 columns, add z-score to this 18 different columns. So it's actually in one shot you can do it using this API. You say, okay, add z-score, I think something will come up. Didn't work, fine, add another three columns. So you're actually using something like a Postman, which is, you know, Postman, right? It's a Chrome web app. So that's all you really need to transform. The entire thing is happening in the background. It can access 20 terabytes or maybe, let's say, 10 terabytes, 20 terabytes, that's typical. And it will do the transformation. It will store it in Park and keep it ready for you. That's it. You just invoke it, go home. You can even do it from home because it's just a REST API. So you don't need to worry about what is the Spark job doing, how many cores it has, what's the RAM. And then if you want to reuse something, you can actually mention that too. Hey, cache it for some time. Cache it on disk. 
take two replications. So even those things we kind of captured in the API. You can read from Parquet, Cassandra, HBase, MongoDB, Teradata, SQL Server, right? And, and that's, those are the things that where you'll spend most of your time trying to even learn the integration. So what we are doing is we are, we are spending a lot of time tuning it so that you don't need to tune it later on. So these are the joins, those are the results, that's it. It just shows up as a result like that. Very simple for you to understand or put it in a UI or put it in some kind of a BI tool, right? The next thing is the examples of aggregation. So this is actually much more sophisticated than basic joins, right? Joins, probably you will cover it and somehow figure it out, but the aggregation is much more complicated because this is a grouped aggregation. If you see the last but one line, you're trying to say group by, snapshot date, division, and region, all three. So all three should be independently grouped. So the entire data set needs to be grouped three times. And then it needs to do various functions on top. One of them is approximate count distinct, min, variance, and then some percentile. But in percentile also, I need one, two, three, four, five, six percentiles. So look at the uh, monstrosity of this. If you try to write Spark code, you have to be so careful about everything. You have to do three groupings and six percentiles for each grouping. And then we don't know how many rows it is going to produce. So think about this now. That's easy now, right? You invoke this, and this is the only thing you need to learn, and you just type it and save it as a template, and you keep editing it, whatever you want. Tomorrow, if you say 0.33, I want another percentile, 33%, you put percentile 33, and this is the JSON result that comes up. You can save it in MongoDB, you can do whatever you want with it. That's the beauty of it. And it computes everything for you, it's all done for you, right? So there's, there's a grouping, so it grouped according to your division and region, and it produces all the output for each of the group. So that saves you like hours, if not days, of time. So we'll also go into what would it take for you to implement deciles. So this is some sample code that we wrote when we tried to do the deciles. So we had to do a lot more stuff, of course, before this. So we had to do multiple transformations and whatnot. But ultimately, the last two lines, you can do it yourself. It's not a big deal. But to reach that point, the efficiency took some time. Like how many partitions should be taken, really? Because you can do repartition sometimes. Sometimes you should use coalis. Coalis combines the partitions, repartition, repartitions, or resplits everything. So it's a big decision you need to make because depending on the size, the broadcast will, may or may not happen. And the other one is the data locality in Spark. You need to make sure that the data which is supposed to be joined is in a similar location. So one of the things that you'll see if you go on the Google internet and just, just see Google for that, uh, how to optimize joins, you'll see some articles about how you pick the partitioner, how you use better partitioners, either it is range partitioner or hash partitioner, how you move things together in each of the Spark workers or executors. So those things are internal. We took care of the whole thing. So that should explain the gravity of like how important this is, right? Because you'll spend months tuning your jobs otherwise. So that's the code. Uh, would you like to use this? Yay. Yeah. One guy uses it. Uh, there are a few more hundred lines uh, at the top and the bottom. Or just use this. So of course, prefer. So for some reason, they prefer this. They just call this. Like, uh, let me just call decile on that column. And if you see that there's a score column there, you can switch over the score column because decile happens by score on a specific column. So it's going to do a decile on the score while taking the column called account status. So each account status, active, inactive, never, pending, cancel, then it takes all the scores, uh, which is actually days since the, comp, uh, the guy was a customer, right? Like two years, three years. We have customers 25 years ago too. So it's a pretty old company. So what will happen now is as soon as you hit this, you will get your results. So you don't need to do that. Another example is this. This is the grouped aggregations Scala code, the actual code here. So it goes into uh, the main part, goes into these two pages, but that's incredibly sophisticated, right? So you can write it, uh, I'm sure, but it's going to take quite a bit of time for you to get to this level. So, and then you have to do all kinds of multi-threading and everything because we do a lot of futures here. Why? Because we are dealing with terabytes, if not petabytes, of data for every single request. You cannot simply say you have all 10,000 cores. So this is the Roadrunner way again. It's a simple API, there's nothing to it. You just need to invoke this and it will give you all the data that you require. Instead of writing this code here, you actually just invoke it, then it will give you the output. The other one that we built on top is called the exploration tool. 
So for feature engineering, it's very important that you even look at what you have. So don't tell me that I have uh, something like, what do I see here? So something like product mix of, uh, or house keys or over the top. So there are a lot of things. But first of all, if you don't even have the capability of looking at the data, which is often the case in our big data space in data science, you can't even like, open the damn file. I mean, the file itself is like 10 terabyte. And you'll oh, try to download on your Windows laptop, and Windows crashes. Then what do you do with it? There's no tool that you can just look at it. Even if you somehow manage to do it, then you try to load into Excel, cannot take it. So what do you do? You can spend a lot of time writing that or the, go this route. So we provided an additional tool on top, which uses the same API, because we have a lot of these APIs, right? Now we build this little tool. UI, that's why it's not that pretty, because it's built by the engineering. So this is used only to explore the data. What kind of data do you have? And then is there anything that I can do? You can build some vectors. There are some nice little things there. So you can build some vectors, do a little bit of feature engineering, and then apply this as transformation back. So your data set is changing every single uh, minute or hour as much as you want. And then this is a killer. We are, this we are, again, trying to get permission to open source. So we build it ourselves. This is a SAS to Python to Scala converter. It converts the language automatically. So you give one language, it will convert back and forth. So uh, as you see, this is a fully automated process. In the back end, it understands the code. We are adding more and more to be completely transparent. Probably we crossed 60 to 70% now. We have 30% more language to cover because it gets tough when it gets to that level. So uh, this is very nice. So the, what, what happens now is people who are very good at SAS, we have a lot of them. They just come, they paste the code. It converts it to Python and Scala at the same time, too. So they are able to study the code. They are, instead of spending time on Scala programming or books, they are able to just convert it and see what does it look like. Same thing for Scala people. Once you write Scala code in Spark, it's nice, very nice. But someone just throws in the wrench. It says, hey, Jupyter doesn't take your code. Fine, use our tool. Put the Scala code, it'll convert to Python, and maybe in SAS, and you can use all three. Uh, in progress is R. We are trying to get R working this year so that you can do four languages back and forth. So it's very interesting. All the code is written in Scala, by the way, to even do the conversion. So in essence, we are trying to automate the uh, entire functionality and feature set of Apache Spark. Uh, ourselves, we consider that uh, we are uh, very loyal customers of Spark. We use all the components and everything right now. For everything, we have 10,000 cores and 20 petabyte cluster dedicated just for data science. No one can touch it. We don't even give access. So the other cluster is for uh, other purposes. So we have many, many clusters, as Kiran pointed out earlier. So the Spark car is something that's the newer one that we are trying to tackle somehow. We are trying to convert all the things. Because when you look at 600 plus models built over years in, uh, of course, SAS and Python in the old school, how to convert that to Spark and deploy it on Spark. We do not want to waste another like three to four years. That's the reason why this project started, saying, hey, there must be a better way to convert from Python and SAS. As I said, we are trying to make it open source this and the entire Roadrunner package itself. So hopefully we'll get the approval this year. Uh, looks like it looks good so far, because I think it will help uh, a lot of people. So similarly, MLlib, we are going deeper and deeper. We are putting more emphasis on text analytics now. So we want to put a lot of the text analytics, like even the starting from the simple topic detection or stop words removal, little things like that, you know, where you have to waste time. We, want, we are trying to put all this stuff into Roadrunner. And then I think we are almost out of time. So the next thing, as Kiran said, this is very exciting. I just talked to him today, said, OK, I can't wait to get back, because we got our GPU boxes the big ones from NVIDIA. So we're going to de deploy fundamentally TensorFlow, and we are going to try to put that also as part of the API layer, because GPU, as you know, it requires a lot more coding and different type of coding. Like there's something CUDA, CUDA programming, and then you have to do uh, GPU, TensorFlow, of course, and then how do you deploy it on Spark? So now it gets even harder for uh, anyone to just adapt to it, so we're going to add these things. And the final slide I want to show, uh, my book is coming up next month. That's my name is Sridhar Allah. So if you can use this uh, discount code, you'll get like 50% off straight till end of June. So use it. I mean, it'll save you some money there. 
So that's in your book, and a lot of these concepts are covered in this book. Not exactly Roadrunner, because it's still not open source, but you'll see a lot of these interesting uh, concepts on data frames, data sets, advanced aggregations, what you can do with graphics especially. It will show you quite a bit of things. So given that, we are always hiring. Always. So you'll see it. All right, we can take questions now. Thank you. Sounds good. We, we probably have only limited about five minutes. So any questions, please feel free to come forward to the stand. Yes, sir. So the question was, how do users consume the output? So we do have in the output also, we can save it to JSON, but we can also save it as Parquet, Hive Table, Cassandra, HPS. We have the entire input set there also. We can even input output to Teradata if you want, really. So the, for them, it's just a choice. Like, what do you want? Fine. If, you, if they're comfortable with saying transformation especially, it gives you one inch to one or more, right? So you say transform, uh, transform one terabyte and then use it in your own Spark code. So they can do that. That's a choice. Uh, the JSON itself will tell, like, hey, I'll save this to Hype. It'll just save it to Hype. All right. Thanks so much. We have to move on to the next speaker. Okay. Thank so you. Fantastic. Appreciate it. It was amazing work. Thank All you. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much.